Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Vibrant Voices webinar, Building an Elder Care System that Actually Cares. My name is Muriel Howden. I am the Executive Assistant and Senior Outreach Advisor for RTO Yarrow. I will be moderating today's session and providing active offer for any participants who wish to ask questions or have information relayed in French. Throughout the webinar, feel free, feel free to use the Q&A box to submit your questions for our guest speaker. Bonjour et bienvenue à notre webinaire Voix Vibrante, dont le sujet aujourd'hui est élaborer un système de soins vraiment axé sur les besoins des aînés. Je suis Muriel Howden, adjointe de direction et conseillère en liaison à RTO ERO. Je serai la modératrice de notre session d'aujourd'hui et je vous invite à poser vos questions ou à partager vos commentaires en français dans la boîte de conversation questions et réponses afin de les soumettre à notre invité. As we begin the webinar today, we would like to pay our respect to the Indigenous lands that connect us across Canada. And then our board chair, Rich Prophet, will introduce today's guest speaker. I am speaking to you today from the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Odenosoni, and the Wendat peoples, which is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We acknowledge, recognize, and honor the ancestral traditional territories on which we live and work, and the contributions of all Indigenous peoples to our communities and our nation. Je m'adresse à vous aujourd'hui du territoire traditionnel de nombreuses nations, incluant les peuples Mississauga de Crédit, Anishinaabek, Chippewa, Odenosoni et Wendat, qui abritent aujourd'hui de nombreux membres des peuples des Premières Nations, Inuit et Métis. Nous reconnaissons et honorons les territoires traditionnels ancestraux sur lesquels nous vivons et travaillons, ainsi que la contribution de tous les peuples autochtones à nos communautés et à notre nation. Merci. Thank you. Miigwech. And now to Rich. I will let Rich introduce our guest speaker today. Thank you, Muriel. Hello, my name is Rich Prophet. I'm chair of the board of directors at RTO ERO. And I want to thank you for joining us today. RTO ERO is a bilingual trusted voice on healthy active living in the retirement journey. We work with our members and partners to advocate for critical policy improvements to address urgent needs now and create a more secure and compassionate future for everyone. Our three key advocacy issues are senior strategy, also geriatric uh, health care, which also may be known as physical and mental health of uh, older adults, and environmental stewardship. I am delighted to introduce our special guest speaker for today's webinar. Andre Picard is a nationally recognized health reporter and columnist for the Globe and Mail, where he has been a staff writer since 1987. Mr. Picard is also the author of five best selling books, and his new book, Neglected No More The Urgent Need to Improve the Lives of Canada's Elders in the Wake of a Pandemic is available now for pre-order. As one of Canada's top health and public policy observers and commentators, he truly is an expert on this topic. I know we are all looking forward to his presentation and I will now turn it back to our moderator, Muriel Howden, to start the webinar. Muriel. Thank you, Thank you so much, Rich. I would like to remind you quickly to submit your questions in English or French using the Q&A box. Note that the chat box is not monitored, so make sure you use the Q&A box. Je vous rappelle de soumettre vos questions en anglais ou en français dans la boîte à questions et réponses. And now let's begin. Mr. Picard, the floor is yours. Uh, merci beaucoup, Muriel. And uh, thank you for that very kind introduction and for the invitation today to this uh, great audience. Uh, today, I want to talk about an issue that should preoccupy all of us of a certain age, and you might be able to tell from my hair color that I fit in that demographic. And that question is, where and how do we want to live as we age? This is one of the key questions of our time in an aging society. 
So to do so, I, I'm going to use what happened in care facilities during COVID-19 as a launching off point. But mostly, I'm not going to talk about COVID. We talk about that a little too much in our daily lives. I'm going to speak mostly about the philosophical and political failings that allowed this carnage to happen. And of course, I want to talk about solutions. I'm going to be relatively brief. I'm going to make some opening comments. But I'm told you're a very engaged audience that uh, you like to ask tough questions like you did when you were in the classroom. So I'm going to leave a lot of time for interaction. And uh, unlike when maybe I was a high school student, this time I've done my homework, I'm prepared. So I, uh, I'm ready for any questions you're ready to throw my way. Évidemment, je suis content de répondre à vos questions en français aussi, mais mes, mes uh, commentaires vont être surtout en anglais pour commencer. Now, I saw two polls recently. One said that 90% of Canadians never wanted to go into a long-term care facility. In the other poll, it was only 85%. Now, these numbers are no surprise, especially given the carnage that happened during COVID-19. Uh, people were leery about long-term care before the pandemic, and now they're downright frightened. We've had about 27,250 pandemic deaths in Canada to date, and more than 18,000 of those have occurred in long-term care homes and retirement homes, so in congregate settings. Um, worse, you know, the numbers are horrifying, but even worse is the way people died. Uh, often abandoned, neglected, starving, dehydrated, wallowing in their own urine and feces. Uh, there's an article in today's Globe and Mail about an inquiry taking place at the Ehron nursing home, which talks about these things. Uh, uh, the first chapter of my book is all about Ehron, but it's only one example. Only, and I use that term loosely, only 51 people died in that home. In many other homes there were more than 100 deaths. About 30, 40 percent of residents in many homes died. This is just carnage on a, a mass scale. Now, beyond that, there was a lot of collateral damage, the isolation, the loneliness, the deconditioning and decline that occurred when residents were locked in and their family caregivers were locked out. And for the most part, they were locked out unjustly and unfairly. And this really hurt uh, particular uh, groups like people with dementia who make up the, the majority of people in institutional care. So the damage is really hard to calculate, but it was devastating uh, well beyond COVID. You know, families entrust their loved ones to these facilities. And these families were betrayed, and they were betrayed profoundly by our public policies and by private and public providers. Now, we know the underlying causes of what happened, uh, an environment that created the ideal conditions for the virus to spread. Uh, this is almost like, uh, you know, early in the pandemic, we talked about cruise ships. These were like landlocked cruise ships but without the fancy buffets. Overcrowding is the norm. We have three and four bedrooms. We have outdated infrastructure that includes poor ventilation, lack of fresh air. Severe staffing shortages have been the norm for many years. During the pandemic, it meant that sick patients were not isolated. Uh, they spread the disease readily to their uh, others in their facilities. Uh, often they didn't even get the most basic care like toileting and bathing, as I mentioned. This is not the way people can live out their lives in dignity. Uh, policies that directly endangered nursing home student uh, residents, like placing the priority on protecting hospitals, were also deadly. Uh, we actually shipped patients who were safe in hospital to homes where they were placed in mortal danger. And we did that just because they were old and on and on. Now, were some of these actions and inactions of providers criminal? Perhaps. I'll leave that to our public prosecutors to decide. Uh, will there be civil lawsuits? Absolutely, they've already begun. But money can't make up for the loss of a loved one. Will there be coroner's inquests and public inquiries? You can bet that we're going to have those out the wazoo. Uh, retrospective inquiries are a Canadian specialty. They've already taken place in Ontario, in Quebec, and they're planned in many other provinces. Now, clearly, there were failings here, policy failings. But beyond that, there were moral failings, profound ones. Uh, we have a social contract in this country that says that we should care for the most vulnerable. That's our duty as a society. And that was violated. It was violated every single day during the pandemic. These are fundamental human rights violations on a grand scale. Again, happening in a democratic country, a wealthy country like Canada. You know, it seems that elders don't seem to have the same rights as others in society. They're considered disposable. 
Now we have this profound ageism that's baked into our public policies and into our attitudes in society. You know, I can't tell you how many times during the pandemic I heard people say very nihilistic things like, well, they're old, they were going to die anyhow. And that's not true. Every one of these deaths was a premature death. Every one of these deaths was preventable. There are many countries in the world that had no deaths in long-term care facilities. There are many countries that had very few deaths among elders, even though they were at greatest risk of the pandemic. Now, our society is aging rapidly. We all know that. This is not a catastrophe, and we have to stop saying that it is. It's actually a triumph of medicine. It's a triumph of social policy. We should be celebrating this every single day. The fastest growing demographic in society is 100-year-olds. That's great, something we could never dreamed of. People are not old and frail and doing nothing. For the most part, people as they age are very active. Uh, I have an uncle who's 93, plays in a Dixieland band, and he complains that the touring schedule keeps him from playing tennis and going out on his boat. This is the reality for many people as they age. This is what we should all aim for. Sure, we'll have a bunch of aches and pains, but they're not overwhelming. We can live good lives as we age and public policy should facilitate that. You know, living longer means we're gonna live a little longer with chronic illnesses, but all that means is we need some supports. We need to adapt. These are not bad things. The real tragedy here is not that people are aging. The tragedy is that we've done nothing to adapt society to the reality. We need social policies that reflect our demographic realities, not social policies based on a, a demographic that existed 50 or 60 years ago when we created Medicare. Now, none of us like to think about aging. Some of us are reminded of it every morning when we look in the mirror by our hair color or lack of hair, but nobody wants to think about that. No one wants to lose their autonomy. No one wants to be dispatched to some institution Nobody wants to be forgotten and alone. And we can counter all these things. You know, this sector, I, I'm critical of the sector, the long-term care sector, the elder care sector, but it's never gonna win a popularity contest. This, this isn't Disney World, getting old isn't always fun, but long-term care is essential for some, for a very small minority. But we have to ensure the care they do need and the care they get is safe and dignified. That has to be the number one priority. Now you heard in the introduction that during the pandemic, I wrote a book, a book called Neglected No More. And it's not about COVID except very peripherally, uh, nor is it a condemnation of the sector whole hog. Uh, it's about larger themes that I've been writing about for decades. And the pandemic gave me an opportunity to explore them in more depth. So what kind of issues? Uh, how do we ensure that every Canadian gets the right care, the right place at the right time? That matters to elders because they make up most of the patients in our system. Again, that's not a bad thing, that's reality. As we get older, we need a little bit more help. Two, how do we structure our health and welfare system so that everyone can live life to their full potential? That's really all we, we can dream of, live to our full potential, whatever that is. And finally, how do we, in all our healthcare interactions, prioritize quality of life? Not just quantity, not doing stuff to people, but helping them live a good life till the end. And I believe that when it comes to our elders in Canada, we, especially our frail elders, we fail on all these counts. We don't deliver what we should to help people live out their lives with dignity. You know, the generation that gave us our beloved Medicare system, that's the generation that is dying in our uh, long-term care homes. They've been forsaken by Medicare, by the social safety net. Now, unfortunately, this isn't news. Uh, there have been countless reports written about this. In fact, there have been about 150 government-sponsored reports written about the shortcomings of Medicare and about elder care in particular. Now, all these reports have the same conclusion, the same conclusion I have in my book, unsurprisingly. The neglect of elders is a systemic problem. And there's only one way to correct it, and that's to fix the damn system. And that's really the blunt message of my book. So the blunt message I try to deliver in every public talk and I, can, I give, we have to stop talking about this. We have to stop pointing fingers. We have to stop passing the buck. 
We have to stop making excuses. And we just have to fix this. We owe that to ourselves. We owe it to our loved ones. You know, assuming the horrors we witnessed during the pandemic finally give us some impetus and our backbone to do, to do these changes, and I hope they do, where do we start? That's the question. You know, there's so much to do, so much to fix. Where do we start? I think we have to start uh, within ourselves. We have to start with a fundamental change of attitude by adopting a philosophy that says we value our elders and we want them to remain active members of our community. Once we have that goal, once we have that philosophy, the really a human rights perspective, if you want to state it that way, then actually everything else is fairly easy. It's just technical implementation. And other countries have done this. The countries who have good elder care have that simple starting point. We want our elders to live among us and to live good lives. We don't have that view in Canada. We have 400,000 elders in Canada living in institutional settings. It's one of the highest rates in the world. It's about 7% of all people over 65 are in institutions. That's at least double what it should be. Some people have to be there, but many do not. What we practice in this country is elder apartheid. And I think that's unacceptable. Now, I know that's a harsh term, but it comes into sharper focus if you know a little history. And again, in the book, I have a whole long chapter on the history, but the short version is that essentially long-term care came up through the penal system. It's not uh, something that has been delivered in the healthcare system for very long. In fact, into the 1960s in Canada, we still had people living in homes, working for their for their room and board uh, in uniforms, much like prison settings. And we called that elder care. Things have changed a lot, but they haven't changed enough. Many of our homes still look and feel like prisons. They're very regimented. People don't have rights. They don't feel like homes. They essentially behave like they have for centuries uh, as almost a punishment for getting old. Uh, today, long-term care homes are not really part of the healthcare system. They're kind of an aside. Uh, and we fund them reluctantly. Our Medicare system uh, coverage in Canada funds hospital and physician cares 100%. Everything else is partially funded, really with no rhyme or reason. Uh, for the most part, long-term care is only partially covered by Medicare. We cover the, the medical aspect of the care, and we do that inadequately. And that's free when I use that term loosely. But residents still end up paying anywhere from $2,000 to $15,000 a month to be in these institutions. Not many people can afford these costs, even with good pensions. Fewer still plan for them. Uh, often they devastate their families. Uh, it takes all the money they've ever saved to, to live out the last few months of their life. Yet, that's where we funnel everyone. We funnel them to a place where they'll be unhappy and penniless. You know, what kind of public policy is that? Uh, the default setting in society should not, that you, not be that you go off to an institution when your health begins to decline. The default setting should be that we want you to stay in your home as long as possible. We want you to remain an active member of the community as long as humanly possible. And we'll only send you to an institutional setting as a last resort if it's needed to protect you. And practically, what does that mean? Practically, it means we have to shift some spending from long-term care to home care. It uh, also means investing in community supports, affordable housing for elders, uh, meals on wheels, respite care, uh, having people shovel your walk. All these little things send people to institutions and they're easily fixable in the community. In fact, the biggest gap in elder care is in community supports. You know, I mentioned um, a few minutes ago, 93% of our elders live in the community, but many of them struggle to get basic supports like just getting the sidewalk shoveled, help with their groceries. All this is so easily solvable. Again, I'm not suggesting we don't need care homes or congregate settings, we do, but they should be a last resort and they should be built purposefully. Uh, as you know, the majority of residents of long-term care are living with dementia, but very few facilities are actually designed for their needs. You know, uh, outdoor spaces to wander safely, for example, are essential. And homes, homes should always be, well, home-like. You know, we have these 200 and 300 bed BMOs across Canada, and that, that's not right. Uh, that's not how people want to live, uh, especially if they've lived in their homes their whole lives. Care homes should be integrated into the community as well. Ideally, they should be paired with other facilities. Uh, they should be beside daycares, uh, 
daycares and schools. Uh, we should see elders every day. They shouldn't be invisible. You know, countries that do this well, children interact with elders every single day. And we have to stop pretending that old people only want to spend time with other old people. It's not true. It has a lot to fix. I could go on and on. So where do we start? You know, I talked about changing a philosophy, and that's important. But then we have to do the, the real practical stuff. And I think we have to begin where the biggest problem exists, and that's staffing. You know, healthcare is a people business, like education, and we need sufficient number of people to provide care. And we underinvest in people in Canada. Uh, there's a lot of clamoring for standards of care, essentially guaranteeing four hours of hands-on care daily. That's a good starting point. We don't do that now. We deliver less than three hours of hands-on care to people. Uh, then we have to talk about staffing ratios. What's the right mix of staff? Probably about 55% personal support workers, 25% RPNs, 20% RNs. So we, get in, we need to get that nursing uh, carried balance right. Now, I think I wish these things weren't necessary. I didn't wish we didn't have to spell them out in legislation. Again, in countries that do this well, they don't have to. They just do the right thing. But standards are a good starting point, a good starting point for fixing the system. I mentioned infrastructure not too long ago. We have to get rid of those wardrooms that look like prisons, you know, three and four people to a room. That's not how to live with dignity as an elder. Money is also a big question. Uh, we absolutely need to invest more because we've neglected this sector for decades. But we don't necessarily need a dramatic amount more than other sectors. Uh, in the recent budget, the government announced $30 billion for safe, affordable child care. I think that's a wonderful initiative, good for society, especially good for working women. But there's no reason we shouldn't be making similar investments for safe, affordable elder care. There's actually more women in this country that care for their elderly parents and in-laws than care for children. They need the support and they need the relief as well. I don't know how much money is needed. There have been estimates of uh, we spend about $35 billion on uh, elder care now. There have been estimates we could easily spend double that. But it's not all about money. It's about changing the attitude, changing uh, how we spend, you know, getting value for money matters just as much as how, how much we spend. Now, I want to wrap up because I'm looking forward to your questions. But the final thing I want to talk about is, you know, the need to reform the system more broadly. This is just one example of how we have to make our health system more reflective of the needs of society. And again, healthcare is all about older people and they're meeting their needs. Long term care is just one part of it. But ultimately, as I said, it's about people about respecting their, their rights and their beliefs, our obligations to them. And we have many obligations that we're not fulfilling. You know, during the pandemic, patient-centered care, patient-centered care is something we talk a, a lot about, but it really took it on the neck. You know, we have to give patients and consumers a voice. We have to give it back to them. Uh, if we had, we wouldn't have locked out people the way we did and made people suffer of isolation and loneliness. There are literally people who died of loneliness during this pandemic. There's no question about it. People also need choice. They need real choice about where they live out their final years, about how they live them out. They don't just need care, but they need quality care. They need dignified care. And all of this is possible. And all of this has to be a priority. And again, once you put the emphasis on quality, everything else pretty well falls into place. And finally, just a few last words on innovation. You know, as you can tell from my brief comments, my, my book is a sometimes harsh condemnation of the care we provide to our elders, and it should be. But I think it's ultimately a hopeful book because I stress that not only do we know all the problems, and I've elaborated some of them, but we know exactly how to fix them. We know all the solutions. We've partially implemented the solutions all over. We have fabulous care homes. We just have to scale up our successes. We have to stop repeating our failures. You know, elder care, like health care, is provided on a spectrum. Yes, there are some terrible homes, the errors of the world that we're looking at in inquiries, but there are also a lot of good ones, too. And I should note, in passing, uh, way too many mediocre ones. But every problem we have has been resolved over and over again. We've done it in pilot projects. We've done it on a small scale. We have to scale up our successes more broadly. 
Now, during my book tour, which, is, which was virtual, by the way, like everyone else, I haven't traveled much. But during this uh, virtual book tour, I participated in many, many calling shows in public forums. I always requested that the same question be asked. Uh, the same question I asked you at the beginning of my talk, where and how do you want to live as you age? The answers I got were overwhelmingly similar everywhere in the country, in every age group, in every economic group. And that gives me hope. People all want the same thing. They know what they want to do. Everyone wants to remain in the community. Everyone wants to remain in their homes as long as possible. You know, the expression, there's no place like home, is one that people take quite literally one we should respect. To the broader question, how do you want to live as you age? The answer can be summarized in three words. Everyone wants the same thing, autonomy, respect, and dignity. Surely we've all earned those. So we must insist that our health and social welfare system delivers those to the very end of our lives. We have to ensure that our health and social policies reflect our values. And I think we have good values. We have them individually. Every one of us loves our mothers, our grandmothers, wants them to be cared for respectfully. And we just have to extend that to the collectivity away from the individual. We have to once and for all demand that all our elders are neglected no more. So I'm gonna start, stop there. Again, thank you for the opportunity to be here. And uh, I'm really happy to answer any questions on or off topic uh, that you might have today. Thank you. Thank you so much, André. This is such a very important and relevant topic. So we are indeed going to move to uh, into the question and answer period. And I can see that we have received a lot of questions. We have a lot of questions in the queue, which is wonderful. Thank you all. So we'll get to as many questions as possible in the time that we have today. Just would like to remind you to submit your questions um, to our guest, André Picard in English or in French using the Q&A box as the chat box is not monitored. So, je vous rappelle de soumettre vos questions en anglais ou en français à notre invité André Picard dans la boîte à questions et réponses. Okay, so André, let's move to the first question. It comes from Claudia. And the question is, should we be asking for LTCs, long-term care, to be included in the Canada Health Act to ensure that residents have the protection of being with the same status as hospital? I think the, the answer to that question is we definitely need to have better public funding. Uh, we have to be more clear about why people are, when and how people are funded. You know, the, the big problem with our uh, Medicare in Canada is not clear why many things are covered and how. So people want clarity on that. Uh, opening up the Canada Health Act, I think uh, I am not very keen on that. I think that's a pen would open a Pandora's box. I think it can be done with parallel legislation more easily. But uh, yeah, the underlying issue is yes, we have to fund this better and smarter to ensure that people uh, can afford to get in homes when when they need them. Thank you, thank you. So the next question is, why do so few people feel called to work with older people? Is it an expression of ageism? I think there's a little bit of ageism in there, but you know, a lot of people love working with older people. It's very rewarding work. It's, uh, you know, there are a lot of good care workers out there, but they're dissuaded from doing it. They have terrible wages. Uh, they have terrible work conditions. One of the big lessons of COVID is that we learned, and I think teachers know this lesson well, is that conditions of work are the conditions of delivery of your service, in this case, in the conditions of care. So if you mistreat your workers, whether it's in schools or in hospitals or long-term care homes, if you mistreat your workers, they're not going to deliver a good service. It's not possible. You have to start and finish with treating workers well, and that's reflected in the care. So uh, the way to get more people working with older people is to pay them a decent wage, to give them benefits, to respect them. And, and we do the exact opposite. Uh, there's a hierarchy in healthcare about, you know, where you work. A hospital is the ideal and you get paid more and you get better benefits. And then you move into long-term care and you get a lot less pay and a lot less, you don't get full-time work. And then home care is the bottom of the barrel. You have to scramble to stick together a whole bunch of uh, short-term contracts. So we, we have to have equity across the board. Every nurse, every personal support worker should be this, paid the same regardless of uh, where they work. And that would resolve a lot of these problems almost overnight because a lot of people would love to get out of the hospital and work with people in their homes, work in care homes. 
specifically, but uh, it's too much, too big of a personal sacrifice, giving up half your salary. That's right. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we have a great question from Catherine. I, I know you touched on it at the beginning of your presentation. Which countries did not experience the COVID tragedy amongst their elders? But more importantly, what do you attribute this? Or to what do you attribute this? I think the, the simple answer is, uh, you know, the best way to protect the most vulnerable in society is not to have circulating virus. So the countries to where elders did best are places like Taiwan and Australia uh, and New Zealand, places where there was very little COVID to begin with. Uh, if there's a virus circulating, we know that older people, frail elders are going to die. That's unquestionable. They just have lesser protection from their immune systems or more vulnerable to viruses. So uh, that's I've been writing about COVID now since uh, January 2020. And that's been my constant refrain. You control spread in the community and you protect uh, those greatest risk. The other part of it is uh, it's not just that that's part of it, but the other way to protect elders is having good labor policies. So in Canada, we have one of the highest rates of death in long-term care. And the simple reason is because workers work at multiple facilities. Uh, I don't blame the workers, but the reality is they were vectors. They brought this illness from one home to the next. You know, it's bad enough having an outbreak in one home, but when those workers go to three other homes in the week, it was just a recipe for disaster. And that's what we had in Canada, a huge disaster. So it's about labor policies. Uh, there's very few countries in the, in the Western world that have three and four bedrooms. Uh, we know that's unsafe. That's a very unsafe practice for infection control. Uh, in Canada, we have them, especially in Eastern Canada, less so in the West. And again, that's why the highest death rates are in Ontario and Quebec. If you look at the data, uh, most people who died were in these, uh, these ward rooms, which were just, again, uh, you couldn't think of a better way to kill someone than to put them in this room during a pandemic. Right, right, yeah. Um, the next question came to us in French, so I'll read it in French uh, first and then in English. Um, so, André, dans vos écrits, vous faites référence à des solutions venant de la communauté elle-même. Pouvez-vous décrire comment une telle dynamique peut s'enclencher? So the question is, um, in your writing, you have referred to solutions coming from within the community. Can you describe how such momentum may start? Alors, je réponds en français en commençant. Je vais vous noter aussi que j'ai écrit mon livre, en, en, il y a une version française, Les Grands Oubliés. Alors, si vous êtes intéressé, euh, dans le, la section solutions, je parle beaucoup de la nécessité de la commune, communauté de s'impliquer. Il y a des gens dans ce domaine qui sont excellents. On a des institutions des, euh, qui sont fabuleux, mais on doit leur donner plus de, de fonds, plus de respect. Alors, je pense qu'on a une dynamique qui existe maintenant en politique que, qui nous permet de, de parler de ces questions. Alors, je pense... Premièrement, et surtout, on devrait prendre davantage de cette réalité politique et insister sur des changements. So just to recap really briefly in English, how can we make change within the community? I think you have to take advantage of what's happening now. There's this unprecedented attention that's resulted from this catastrophe, and we have to push our politicians to do more. There's been a little bit of talk on the campaign trail federally about addressing this, a few billion dollars in promises, but we have to really keep pounding away on this, and mostly provincially, a lot of this is provincial. So really insist on the changes. Uh, to me, the most uplifting thing during my book tour has been uh, actually the interest of young people in this topic. That's to me is what's ultimately going to change is if people are interested across the political spectrum. And young people have really taken this to heart. They see how their parents and their grandparents have been treated and they're, they're literally sickened by it. So I think if, if we're demanding change at all ages, it'll change quickly. There will be that, that tipping point, And I really hope it comes soon after this election. Absolutely, great advice. So the next question is great for Mary. We'll get to this um, now. And then the following for the following question, I will actually call um, the chair of the board, Rich Prophet, and our CEO, Jim Grieve, as I think it'll be a really great group question. Um, okay, so let's go to Mary's question right now. So Andre, what is your opinion of the idea of a universal public insurance system for LTC as suggested by Ito Pang of the University of Toronto. What do you think of that? Yeah, I addressed this a little bit earlier, but I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's necessary. I think we just have to decide what are the limits of it. 
right? We can't fund all things for all people all the time. So we have to decide, uh, I address, should it be part of uh, the Canada Health Act? I think that would be problematic. So let's say we have separate legislation. Uh, then we have to decide what do we cover? I think we absolutely have to cover all the uh, health related uh, gestures in these homes. The question, the tough one becomes about the rent. There is a rent component of this. You are in a home. So there should be some obligation for people to pay who can afford it. So we have to figure that out. Again, I always look to countries who do this well. So I look at countries like Norway and Finland, and they make people pay for their room and board, but they don't make them pay for their health care. And they, you know, it's uh, adjusted to your income. Uh, people who are wealthy pay a lot to be in a long-term care home in Finland, and they should pay a lot in Canada. So we have to figure there has to be some element of payment there because we don't really have a, a universal housing system in Canada, for better or worse, we all pay for our housing. So I think we have to find those components. Uh, I'll, also, I'll also answer that by ans answering a question I know will come because it comes in every uh, event I do, is people are gonna ask, should we get rid of for-profit care? And my answer to that doesn't please everyone, but I don't think that's a, a priority. I think it's problematic. I don't think we need private for-profit care, but I don't think if we got rid of it overnight, it would have changed ever, anything. Quebec uh, has very little private care and it has the worst outcomes for COVID. So there are much more fundamental things in ownership. Uh, the other thing about private public is uh, there was a good report in Ontario about this that had a really great solution. And one that I agree with, it said that there should be no profit in care. So the care element should always be delivered by not-for-profits, by government institutions. And who owns the building? Who collects the rent? I don't care about that. That can be for profit. It should be regulated. It should be legislated. But I don't care. The, one of the big problems in our long-term care sector right now is we have real estate companies who are forced to deliver care, and they don't want to. And they don't make money off care. They don't like doing it. They shouldn't be doing it. They like the real estate component. They make a lot of money off that. Well, let them do it. And we have to really, I think, uh, separate those two components. And that, to me, deals with the, the for-profit element that, that bothers a lot of people. That is such an interesting point. Thank you. Um, so for the next question, um, we're going to make it a group answer. But I'm going to call on to Rich Puffett, the chair of the board, and uh, Jim Grieve, our CEO. Um, so let me read the question first. Um, can you think of a possible champion, whether a person or a group, that could successfully influence Canadians and the government to stop neglecting the health care needs of older Canadians? So, uh, Rich, do you want to take that on first? Uh, certainly, Muriel. Uh, I, I think what we've seen, uh, something like this, a champion in British Columbia, they also have one, I believe, in Nova Scotia. It's called a seniors advocate in the government. It's not tied to either of the parties or whatever, but that individual uh, is a great champion for seniors. And in fact, on uh, November the 3rd, Isabel McKenzie, the seniors advocate for British Columbia is, is, is part of a webinar here by RTO ERO. That's one thing. And obviously we've been advocating for a seniors advocate in Ontario as well. Another great uh, champion, there's, uh, we're advocating for a UN convention on the rights of older people. Uh, this is a very necessary. We see that as rights for uh, students. We've seen it rights for various groups, but there aren't any for elder people because uh, I think Andre indicated almost before that sometimes we've seen the uh, seniors being warehoused in institutions. And what we want the seniors advocate, a senior advocate to do would be to uh, recommend that uh, education take place rather than spending billions and billions of dollars on institutions, which uh, makes the government look good, but spend that on educating seniors so they can stay in their own residence as Andre has indicated for uh, uh, for the 90% that do uh, wish to remain in their home as, as long as they possibly can. As I said, uh, we ourselves, the National Institute on Aging, we partnered with them, and we are having uh, research. Uh, two, in two interns are doing research on seniors, and in fact, they're going to be reporting to the uh, fall forum. And uh, 
those are some of the champions, and I know Jim has more to add to that. Well, it's a it's a it's a fantastic question, and I I can't wait to hear Andre answer this one because, uh, first of all, I'm not going to give you a name. I don't have a name uh, of of a particular person who would be the champion. That said, um, you know we're a country supposedly um, you know advanced and and looking forward all the time with a decent healthcare system that is universal. We don't have a pharma care system that is available across the country and we don't have a national senior strategy. So it strikes me, and these are, these are major planks in our advocacy uh, these days, this whole business of not having a senior strategy is, the funda- is one of the fundamental problems. Why we, don't, we can't name a nonpartisan key champion other than Andre Picard, who would be fantastic, um, you know, to head this up. But it can't be political. It has to be, you know, an advocate who, who has sway and who has purchase across the country. You know, uh, just before we came on, I just realized that, um, you know, the auditor has had a look at one of the province's transfer spending or transfer payments and is underspent by $2.3 billion of pandemic transfer money. Well, how is that possible? How is that a, a way to stand up and be counted as a, as a political entity in a province where we've had um, rather staggering numbers of people pass away during the, the, the pandemic and yet not spend the monies that are sent? Uh, so it's not a federal government issue. It's not a provincial government issue. It's an all governmental issue but we need someone with an awful lot more sway. And we certainly need a plan. A, a national senior strategy would be a decent plan. Where is it? Andre, your take on this? Well, those are very good suggestions. I can hardly do better, but I would just, uh, I would urge people to, uh, if they have the chance to listen to Isabel McKenzie, she's the, the seniors, uh, uh, advocate in BC. In my book, I say every province should have a seniors advocate. I say she is the person, the one person who's changed elder care for the better in this country more than anyone. So she she really listened to her. She has a lot of wisdom to share. Uh, beyond that, I would say, I think in governments, we have to have ministers for seniors that are not just junior ministries that have to you know, actually oversee the delivery of care to seniors broadly. Uh, in a province like Ontario, for example, seniors care is spread over five different ministries. So no one is responsible. Everyone passes the buck. We need someone with clout in cabinet. This is a really important demographic and that cabinet post should have clout and it doesn't. And the final thing I'll say is, I think the single most important thing is we should all be our own advocates. That's really what will change things. If every individual takes interest in this, especially when we're relatively young and relatively healthy, uh, we should all be fighting now to ensure that we're gonna get decent care when we need it. Uh, when you need it, it's too late. Unfortunately, you have you're in crisis. There's a lot of demands on your time, and you just can't advocate. So, take advantage now. Get your grandchildren and your children involved because they're going to benefit from it if you get good care. This is amazing, Andre. And actually, RTO Yarrow is all about advocacy. So it's such a really, really good point. Um, we have a really great question coming from Kahan, and of course, you, you've touched on this, but. Um, can we actually, can we have places for elders to live independently, but in a welcoming, assisted, uh, assistive community setting, especially when the physical layout of the home is just no longer safe? Is it doable? Oh, it's absolutely doable. It exists all over the world. Uh, I, I, in a uh, well, chapter of my book, I look at uh, long-term care facilities or elder care around the world. And the one I single out as really the gold standard is, is Denmark. So Denmark has this adopted this philosophy in the 1980s. It said, our, our society is aging. How are we going to respond? And they, they said, we're going to ensure that elders remain among us. So they made this deliberate decision and then they built a system to do that. So they have excellent home care. So many people can stay in their homes and they get assistance. And then they have care homes that actually look like homes. So they're roughly a dozen people. Uh, If I walk down the street in Copenhagen, which I've done, you can see family home, family home, care home, family home. You don't know the difference. Uh, People don't wear uniforms. The help is just, they live there. They live with the residents. 
Uh, the residents get to cook and eat when they want, to get up when they want. It's actually their homes. It's not like our institutions where it's regimented. You eat breakfast at six, you have your dinner at 4 p.m., unfortunately, and stuff like that. So make it a home. Uh, put it, they're all beside schools, they're all beside daycare centers, so that the kids, when the kids have recess, they come and play with the older people. It's just normal for them. Uh, so that, that's what we have to do. And society is all, they adapted their society so that older people can, you know, the lights last longer, just little things like that. Uh, we're going to give you 40 seconds to cross the intersection, not 20, which is impossible for you to do. These little things really matter dramatically, but you have to think about them. So yeah, the answer to the question is yes. Uh, we have excellent models of this uh, in Canada. There's a lot of uh, commercial models out there. I don't want to promote anyone in particular, but there's Green Homes and Eden Alternative. They all have fancy names, but they all have the same thing. Small, uh, intimate settings where the residents do what they want. They live, uh, they decide how care is provided and how they live. It's not an institutional imposition. Uh, dementia villages are another example. Uh, which are great. The only problem is they're extremely expensive. You have to pay out of pocket. You know, nobody, not many people can afford ten or fifteen thousand dollars a month. Uh, we should be able to provide this care in our in our public system to people who need it. And then I'll finally say, because I don't want to badmouth the public system, uh, one of the best homes in Canada. The last chapter of my book is about Sunnybrook Veterans Centre in Toronto. That's an old rundown building. It doesn't look very nice, but the care is fabulous. And it's all about patient-centered care. Uh, the average age in that facility is 94. So there's a lot of uh, not very young men living there, all of them with dementia. They have a beautiful wandering garden. You can go out and wander in the garden day or night. You eat when you want. You wear whatever clothes you want. Uh, there's a pub. Uh, there's, all, you know, there's a library. It's like home. Even though it's not the nicest looking place outside, it's a beautiful environment. And that's, again, that doesn't cost any more than anything else. It's publicly funded. And we took really good care of our veterans, but we've stopped doing that. And the point I make at the end of my book is if it's good enough for veterans, they deserve tre good treatment, but so does everyone else. That's how we should treat all our elders, the way people are treated at Sunnybrook. Uh, that's amazing, Andre. I actually think you kind of partially or maybe fully responded to the next question, but I'm still going to read it because it came in, Fran in, in French, um, but I know you definitely touched on this when you talked about um, the space in Toronto and, of course, Denmark. Um, so the question is from Jean. Pouvez-vous élaborer sur les modèles dans les pays qui ont réussi à bien traiter leurs aînés? So could you please elaborate on models in countries that have actually managed to to treat their elders or their seniors well, right? Well, il y a beaucoup de modèles différents, un peu de différence, mais le, les traits fondamentaux sont que les les institutions sont petites, les gens vivent comme ils veulent, ils mangent comme ils veulent, ils se relèvent avec l'heure qu'ils veulent, euh, le staff ne porte pas d'uniforme, ce n'est pas une prison, c'est une maison et c'est intégré dans la communauté, à côté d'une école, euh, d'un un CPE, etc. Alors vraiment la philosophie c'est le plus important, pas l'infrastructure. Mais euh, la question, cette idée de de CHSLD avec 200, 300 lits, c'est impensable dans des pays comme le, le Danemark, la Finlande, la Norvège. C'est des petites institutions. Euh, en Finlande, c'est la loi que tout le monde devrait avoir accès à l'extérieur, que la lumière naturelle est un droit pour tout le monde. Alors, des petits euh, changements comme ça sont très essentiels à une vie, euh, vivre notre vie en dignité jusqu'à la fin. Fantastic. Thank you so much, André. Um, next question from uh, Janice. I am sure you've heard this question many, many times. What suggestions, André, do you have to get governments to act versus just talk? Well, I think we just have to, uh, you know, you just have to, uh, I believe in kind of the, the water torture test. You have to just keep hammering away at it over and over. Uh, politicians need to believe that this matters. I think one of the great impediments to not fixing elder care, something we've known for decades needs to be fixed, is that people don't make it a ballot box issue. They complain about it and they rail about it and they're mad about it. But when they go to the ballot box, as they're going to do next Monday, they kind of hold their nose and say, oh, well, I'm going to vote on the economy or whatever. People very rarely vote on health care. And if they did, politicians would pay attention a lot more quickly. Uh, but I, I, think, I think there is 
I think there's the, the willingness to address this and we just have to individually and collectively just keep hammering away at it. Uh, the, the time is right. Uh, you know, we saw this $30 billion investment in childcare and I think there's an almost equal willingness to do so in elder care. We just have to uh, get across the way working women have done very well as you know, I've convinced governments that listen, you got to fix things or you're not going to get our vote. That's why we got a child care program and uh, they can do the same for elder care. Because as I mentioned, there's just as many people. And, and I say women because it's the vast majority. That's to be honest, there are some men who do care, but it's very much falls on the shoulders of women like child care. And we need to help them out. They, they need respite. Uh, it destroys their careers. It's bad for the economy. We really need there are many economic benefits for this. So I think that's the final thing I would say is. I often say, I, I know you're all, you're very good advocates in your group, but to me, the key of advocacy is always, I say, speak the language of the person you're trying to influence. And the language of government is money. And investing in elder care is a good investment. It's a payback for people who've given, who've paid their taxes for 50 or 60 years. And it's also a good way to keep uh, working people in the economy, especially women. And it's a good way to provide good jobs for newcomers like immigrants who do these jobs. If we double the salaries of personal support workers, we do a tremendous benefit to the economy uh, because we have these hardworking people who are going to use that money wisely and they're going to spend it. And it's going to be, there's no disadvantage to, to investing being in elder care. Really, really good point. I actually, if uh, Rich Buffett, the chair of the board is around, I'd love his um, take as well on this uh, question. And, and uh, if Jim is around, of course, uh, too. But Rich, what suggestion do you have to get governments to act versus just talk? Uh, thanks, uh, Muriel. Well, I showed at the outset, when we're talking about these books, these are very important because within them, we talk about the influence of one, that's each one of our 82,000 members, how they can influence whatsoever, all the people. They can influence legislation, uh, they can influence in the vote, but there's the power of many as well. Each of the 51 districts that we have across Canada, they can uh, greatly influence because uh, even though I didn't say it, or I didn't hear it said, the greatest champion that we have is each one of our 82,000 members. Because as Andre said, if we bring 82,000 people, bring long-term care to the attention of the government, it is going to be addressed. And so therefore, utilize a lot of the information that is in these books especially on the seniors care, on the senior strategy. We know about the pharma care, we know about the national long-term uh, senior strategy, but this is where 82,000 people can make a, a profound difference and impact on the uh, culture of Canada. Well, if I may, just uh, very quickly, first of all, those white papers that uh, Rich has been holding up are available on our website. You don't need to, uh, send for these or have them mailed to you. They're up there, ready to go. So help yourselves. Um, the, the neat thing is what we've done, our ad, you've tipped, uh, you've let out our secret. Our secret of advocacy is loading up the individual member and their family. And so um, as, as in addition to what uh, Rich has said, we've actually uh, uh, promoted with every one of our members to get out and meet their MPs during this significant process until next week and beyond uh, to meet with their MLAs, to meet with their MPPs, to meet with their municipal, because the municipalities have a pretty significant role to play in making the Denmark-like home care possible. Um, and, and so you'll find in each of those uh, white papers, um, advocacy questions that need to be asked of politicians of all stripes at all levels. And that's what we're doing. We're, we're in, sorry to use a sports analogy, we're using a full court press on all levels uh, to really advocate this, uh, this whole issue of seniors' health and seniors' respect and growing uh, old with dignity in your home if you can do it. Uh, and that's, that's uh, this is a nonpartisan 
issue. And there are other organizations that we've partnered with in the past and currently seven or eight of them that are also national and they're always on the same page as we are. So we're trying to make our clamor quite loud and quite individual and quite specific um, in order to get to that kind of childcare-like response through federal funding and provincial funding. Thank you so much. And I, I should thank you very much, Rich and Jim, for coming on. And I should uh, remind or inform everyone that the, um, the three uh, uh, white papers that Rich showed us um, are actually on, on the key, the three key advocacy issues of RTO ERO are actually available on the RTO ERO website. Just wanted to clarify this. So the next question, I'm actually going to go to another French question. It's a bit long, so I'll read it in French, but I will summarize it in English, um, if you don't mind. So, uh, Christian, thank you for your question. So, il y a beaucoup de discours, mais jamais on ne voit de solution possible entre les autres. Construire des maisons de retraite immenses à plusieurs étages qu'on annonce comme une vie rêvée, comme une vie dans un hôtel, mais nous ne passons jamais très longtemps dans un hôtel et il faudrait plutôt favoriser les échanges avec les autres générations. Tout le monde y gagnerait, surtout dans nos sociétés modernes. Beaucoup d'aînés, d'enfants qui sont issus de familles recomposées. So, if I understand well, Christian is, is you know, mentioning that we're, we're always, you know, having all those discourses, but we don't see real solutions. And we're always talking about building those perfect, beautiful, big retirement homes. But really, shouldn't we focus more on the relationships between generations? Um, on that care, um, especially now that we have a lot of, you know, families that um, are different and are separated. So um, what's your take on this, André, on, on the, the generational relationship? Oui, on devrait définitivement offrir du support aux familles. Les familles font le, la grande majorité du travail. On doit s'adapter à notre réalité multiculturelle. Il y a beaucoup de, de communautés qui veulent garder leurs aînés chez eux. Ils ont besoin d'un peu d'aide et ça peut empêcher la construction de ces grands, grandes institutions qu'on n'a pas besoin. On a aussi des uh, CHSLD très spécialisés, uh, chinois, uh, sikh, etc. Ça, c'est un, un modèle intéressant. Ils ont tendance à être plus petits, mais ça, c'est un très bon modèle. Parce que garder quelqu'un chez eux, c'est une bonne idée, mais des fois, c'est impossible. Moi, j'ai eu deux parents avec la démence. À un certain point, c'est impossible de le faire. Uh, c'est injuste pour la, la personne. Alors oui, on doit faire, je pense, un peu des deux. So I think, yeah, these intergenerational families uh, in multicultural Canada are a really interesting thing. We need to support them. It's a way of preventing people to going into institutions. I mentioned too that there's a big trend in having, you know, very specific homes like Korean homes, Sikh homes, uh, people living in commonality. Uh, in the book, I have a, a chapter about something called radical rest homes. So it's a way of different generations living together and helping each other uh, and as a way of avoiding into going into institutional care and people. So there are homes of artists or homes of people who speak uh, Polish and they, you know, they live young people and older people and they interact and they do childcare. So there's all kinds of models out there that are great that are not about uh, sending people away, but integrating them into the community. So we, we have to be a little more imaginative. And again, when we have these successes, we have to invest in them. Uh, it can't be all about building these large homes as, as the question asked. You know, politicians love to cut ribbons. So they're a little less in, in keen to invest in these other things, but the other ones are much more efficient and cost effective. That's great, thank you. Um, uh, we have a, a great question coming up from Joyce. Uh, she says, how do we find um, which LTC facilities in our town are oriented towards dignified home-like environments and care rather than institutional efficient operations? Are they lists that give ratings to the various aspects of life in these places, like such as staff ratios, food preparation, socialization, et cetera? Do you know any of that? Yeah, that's a really good question and an important issue. I talk about it about in the book, how it's really impossible to get good information. And as I mentioned earlier, almost all these decisions happen in a time of crisis. Uh, you know, you are you don't want to think about this thing. Finally, if one day your mother falls, she breaks her hip, she can't go back home. And you make these decisions in a panic, which is the worst way to make them. 
So again, I urge people do this research now when you're young and when you're healthy and be ready. And that will make a world of difference. Uh, because our wait lists are so long, there's 34,000 people on the wait list in Ontario alone for a place in long-term care. You often don't get a lot of choice. You're told you can have a place in this bed uh, 100 kilometers from your home and you have 24 hours to decide. And if you don't, you go to the bottom of the list again and you might wait another year. Those are impossible decisions to make that people shouldn't have to make. So unfortunately, there is very little information. Some provinces are better. For example, uh, uh, Alberta, it's fairly easy to get uh, information on homes, but they won't tell you anything about private homes. They'll only tell you about the public ones. And that's, that's not uh, a way to do things. You have to be more open and give people options uh, whether they like them or not. There's a few gr groups that are forming to try and provide this information. Uh, and again, if we give them a little funding, they, it could go a long way with helping people. But yeah, really, really tough decisions. One of the big failings of our healthcare system, where do you get basic information to navigate what you need? And it's a, it's a big hole. Yeah, thank you. Um, great question about physicians from John. So is it an issue that they are as, that they are many times more pediatricians than geriatric physicians when the demographic of zero to 17 year old is roughly the same size as 65 plus. Yeah, it's a really good example of how our public policies are illogical, that we, we do train many more pediatricians and geriatricians, and it makes, makes no sense. That, again, that's a policy that's existed from since the 50s, and we just uh, don't change it. And uh, yeah, we have to change really fundamental things like that. We also have to make geriatrics more attractive. It shouldn't be a really low paying job. Uh, it should be a, a job that, that people covet. And we, you know, that's about changing societal attitudes as well. So yeah, it's a really good example of, of illogic in the system. Yeah. And we have a question from uh, uh, Jean Franklin Hampshire, who uh, may sound familiar to you, Andre? A uh, very important question. So, I'm presently a sole caregiver at home for my husband. We have no children and no siblings who live nearby. Um, after two years of being constantly on duty 24 7, I'm tired. And yes, I want to keep my husband at home as long as possible. So, the question is what could society do to help caregivers like me continue our important work? Yeah, really important question. I, I Sadly, I hear these stories over and over again. That's the reality is uh, older women caring for their even older uh, husbands. So that's what most caregiving is. Uh, there are 7.8 million people in Canada who provide care to a loved one. And about 10% of them, about 800,000 people do it as a full-time job, unpaid job, about 50 hours a week or more. That's the reality. We burn people out. We drive them into the ground, and again, people end up in institutions as a result. So what's the solution? Well, what she needs is some respite care. She needs a break sometimes. That's a really good investment from the public system. It prolongs the time people can spend at home. Uh, she needs more home care support. We have uh, home care is the only service in Canadian healthcare that has arbitrary limits. You have a maximum of three hours a day in Ontario. I often say to people, imagine if we said you need 12 hours of chemotherapy, but sorry, we only pay for three hours. Well, why? Well, because, because that's the rule. We, we can't do that. We have to give people the care that they need. Now, there has to be some limits. Uh, I was going to say it can't be 24 hours a day, but sometimes it can be. Sometimes that is cost effective. So we have to figure that out. So it's really simple stuff. Give people respite care, give them some home care, uh, give them some community supports, you know, make it easier for her to go out and get her groceries, have a volunteer do it for her, uh, have meals on wheels so she doesn't have to cook. All of this stuff pays off in spades and we just don't do enough of it. We have fabulous community groups. They do what they can, but they're, they're overwhelmed and they're under funded. Uh, I, in, in my, when my children were young, we used to do something in Montreal called Centre Paul Roulant, where we would bring meals, hot meals to, to elders living alone in the community. And the food was important, but even more important was just the interaction. They got to talk to, my yeah. kids would go in, talk to them for half an hour. And that was often the only visitor they had in a week. So this stuff all really matters a lot to keep caregivers uh, sane and, and healthy. And, you know, one of the saddest things that I see over and over again is I see caregivers and they're, the person they're caring for for years dies and they die shortly after. They literally kill themselves with 
caring. Uh, you know, I call it in the book, I call it that people are conscripted by love. You know, people want to do this, but we have to make it easy. We have to make it dignified as well. The caregiving has to be dignified, not just the care. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Um, th I can't believe how fast time is passing by. Um, so we are down to the last 10 minutes of our webinar, and this is amazing. We still have lots of questions. We'll get to as many as we can in the little time that we have left. Uh, merci encore pour, pour, pour uh, toutes vos questions. On a encore 10 minutes sur ce webinar, donc on va essayer d'adresser le plus de questions possible. So the next one, André, is from Jerry. Um, are naturally occurring retirement communities, the NORC, um, part of the answer to the LTC problem, problem um, and why or why not? Yeah, so good question about NORCs. I do have a chapter in the book about them. So what they are, so if people who don't know, is if you travel around your cities, you'll notice that there are neighborhoods with lots of old people. People have just been living in their homes forever. And this is essentially a naturally occurring uh, retirement community. So everybody, all these retirees live in the same area. So what do you do? Do you ship them off one at a time to a care home or do you bring services to them? So if you bring services to them, it's way more efficient. People are happier and that's what we have to do. So NORCs are often done in apartment buildings. So you take apartment buildings, they're not retirement homes officially, but they're full of retirees. And what do you do? I have an example in Toronto, you move in nurses. The nurses live there. They go up and down when people need help. Uh, people go in and cook meals. And it's a way of preventing this you know, awful transition to care homes. It's way, way more expensive where people don't wanna be. So it's all about keeping people in the community, whether it's in uh, standalone homes or apartments, a really good, and there's again, there's really good models all over Canada, but underfunded, underused. So yeah, it's a, thanks for that question. A very specialized question, someone very knowledgeable there, but uh, NORCs yeah. are definitely part, part of the solution. And the other one I mentioned earlier when I was speaking French, the uh, 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 homes where you, you have specialized homes in the community. Uh, uh, I'm, for, I'm forgetting the name, I said it earlier, but uh, anyhow, uh, where you just bring people with specialized backgrounds, artists, et cetera, and they live in almost, a, almost like a, a, a commune, uh, a communal setting in this yeah. in the city. Sorry, radical yeah. rest homes is the word I was looking for. That's amazing. Um, the next question actually is on uh, quality of care um, uh, from Ellen. So uh, she says, I'm concerned about PSW training um, for those working in se with severe dementia, especially nonverbal residents. I witness um, poorly trained PSW who then train new PSWs, thus perp uh, perpetrating the, um, the poor care. Um, I would like to see PSWs train more specifically for working with the most vulnerable amongst the aged. Um, has there been any consideration in this regard? Yeah, so a really important question. Uh, personal support workers or care aides, uh, préposés, or bénéficiaires, they have different terminology around the country. Uh, the problem is there are no standards. This, these are not regulated professions, so anybody can hang up a shingle. I can tomorrow call myself a PSW and start working, even though I know nothing. Uh, but on the other hand, there are excellent training programs. We have great college programs around the country, really well-trained personal support workers. So we have to make sure that people are actually trained, but nobody is monitoring or overseeing that. And it's, uh, as noted in the question, really especially important for people with dementia. Uh, anybody who's had a loved one who's ever tried to bathe someone with dementia, for example, this is very specialized work. This is not easy. Uh, toileting is not easy if you've never done it. This stuff has to be learned. And it reminds me, you know, we have to offer that training to families. We shouldn't expect them to know how to do this. Uh, that can save lives as well. Just training people how to give a shower to someone who doesn't necessarily want a shower, uh, how to, to feed people without them choking if they have swallowing problems. These are things that can be learned and they can help people care for their loved ones. But back to the initial question, absolutely we have to ensure better training. And I, I think part of this is going to be regulating the profession, uh, having basic standards, a 32 week uh, college course, for example, I think should be the minimum uh, to ensure people can do this. But you know, a lot of great PSWs, really well-meaning, uh, really dedicated, but that's not always enough. It's not good enough to have a good heart. You have to have skills. And this is really skilled work. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the next question from Linda is, uh, please comment on a Bill of Rights for Essential Caregivers 
who work so hard to advocate for family in LTCs um, or in LTC yet are often disrespected outside of being a POA, a, you know, the power of a, a attorney. So um, what would you say about that Bill of Rights for uh, essential caregivers? Yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of movement to that, to have a Bill of Rights. And I think that stuff is important symbolically, but more important is just respecting those rights, whether there's a bill or not. This, should be, uh, this shouldn't be a discussion in any way. We really have to take care of our, our caregivers, especially the unpaid caregivers family. Uh, you know, the, the example in COVID, just locking people out for eight months when these people, uh, families provide the bulk of care, even in institutions, and locking them out was barbaric was unacceptable. We had to find better ways to keep people from spreading illness rather than uh, allowing people to die of isolation and loneliness. So that's an example of where rights were just fundamentally abused uh, for the, you know, because it was easy for government and it shouldn't be easy for government. It should be easy for caregivers. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And then we have the last question from Joyce, and then I will call on um, our CEO, Jim Grieve, for the final remarks. Um, so Joyce's question is, um, uh, André Picard, what do you think will be the single most important thing that people can do to force the federal government to invest heavily in reliable, easily accessible, quality home care to allow people to age in place and stop building institutions. Yeah, I think again, it comes back to, I think the single most important thing is getting the message across that uh, we all want to live out our lives in a dignified manner that, uh, you know, providing uh, physician care and hospital care is important. That's the crux of our Medicare system, but that's not enough. It's not enough to just do sickness care. We have to do health care. We have to let people uh, live and die in dignity. And we just have to keep, as I said before, just hammer away at that. And we have to convince them uh, and we have to make it a ballot issue. If people know you're going to vote on this, it, they'll do it. Uh, this is not, as someone noted before in a question, quite rightly, this is not a partisan issue. There's no disagreement among the parties. They all say the right things. But we have the way to get them to act is to to make them understand that they'll pay if they don't do it, and they they don't have to pay because we don't vote on these issues. And uh, the final one, as I said before, is I think it has to cut across uh, age groups. To, again, young people taking interest in this that's really really important. Get rally your grandchildren, get your children on this, and that's really going to move it forward probably faster than anything. And again, they have a self-interest in doing it. They want, they should want to see their mums and their grandmothers cared for uh, respectfully. And I, I think when they put it in those terms, they, they'll embrace this. And uh, young people are really good at advocacy. They're much better than us uh, older people. Thank you so much. Jim? Uh, thank you, Muriel. And uh, Andre, honestly, a huge thank you. Um, we anticipated that you'd be fabulous. Uh, many of us have seen you on many, many opportunities uh, on the national or on the agenda or any, any number of places. Clearly, uh, we need to deeply dive into the book, your book, and we post that um, title up here on, on uh, the chat, which is great. Um, what a dynamic presentation. It's exactly what we thought we would get. And true to form, our members are not shy and retiring. They are quite engaged particularly in this issue. And, um, you know, part of the reason, you know, we're 53 years old as an organization, but it's only in the last four years that we've said, we're 82,000 serious uh, retirees who are active voters, actively engaged. And why aren't we taking this as an advocacy issue uh, to heart? And we started that four years ago and we're now regular presence uh, in, on Queen's Park uh, in numbers of other provinces when they have election issues um, and certainly on Capitol Hill. Uh, that is our effort to sort of um, pull together our membership and, and give them, load them up with some of the facts and figures. We now can update, update those thanks to you uh, and really get their voice, individual voices heard along with our collective voices. And we're, we're prepared to do all kinds of things. In addition to partnering with seven or eight other national organizations, we run webinars like this that inform our membership. And we had you know, just under 400 people um, sign on today. Everyone that signed on today, Mr. Picard, Picard 
uh, will receive um, the recording of this event so that uh, they can review some of the great words you've, you've used and some of the great questions. Uh, but also everybody who registered and was unable to make it will also get that. We, we uh, don't let any stone go unturned. Uh, thank you so much for um, what feels like a, an, an optimistic direction uh, for long-term care. And the only way that's going to be sustained is if we pick this idea up and keep pushing forward, as you say, and following the money, which is so important in, in, in the elder care world at this point. So the recording will come. Uh, everyone will get that. Um, and I do deeply thank you for, for being a part of this, uh, I think, transformational webinar. You know, uh, for everyone listening uh, and following the recording, I'd like to invite you to join our next Vibrant Voices webinar. It's October 13th, and it's Diana beresford Crager, and she is going to be uh, speaking on our, one of our other issues, and that is environmental stewardship. And her topic is saving the forest, saving us. And uh, honestly, it, it's just going to be quite a, another remarkable opportunity to dig into what personally we can do, each of us, uh, to save this um, forest and save the environment. The other is on November 3rd, Isabel McKenzie, you've heard her name a number of times today, a seniors advocate for the province of British Columbia, very articulate, just like Mr. Picard, and Dr. Carrie Lee Cassidy, a professor of geriatric psychiatry at, at Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia. They're going to present paths to wellness for older persons, body, mind, and spirit, a perfect complement to uh, the work we've done today. So for more information, just make sure that you register through vibrantvoices.ca and we will look forward to seeing you next time. Again, Monsieur Picard, Merci beaucoup, fantastic work. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing everyone back uh, at our next opportunity. Farewell. Au revoir.